Hi, I'm Dr. Courtney Cogburn. I'm an assistant professor. I think some, some of my um, students might be in the audience. Then. That's where the cheers are coming from. Um, it's kind of like having your mom in the room. Um, so thank you for uh, joining us, joining me, to talk about some important initiatives happening here at Columbia University. I'm doing some work in uh, virtual reality where we're imagining ways to use it as a tool to help people better engage issues of uh, racism. The next slide was supposed to be a follow-up to the video, which is a TEDx talk around uh, talking about this experience where I share my personal experiences uh, around the death, learning about the death of Trayvon Martin. Um, after he died, I was on Facebook and uh, saw a lot of my friends, uh, some of whom were pregnant with black boys, talking about um, uh, how stressed they were and that they weren't sleeping. And they were sort of lamenting over bringing their children into this world. Um, and juxtaposed to that, some of my white friends were posting kitten memes and cupcake recipes. And while some of them were uh, talking about the death of Trayvon, it was clear to me that they weren't holding his death in their bodies in quite the same way, that the death of the stranger didn't quite have the same impact on their lives. Um, and so it led me to think about how do we bridge this gap? How do we build stronger, deeper emotional connections to the realities of racism? Um, and so in my work, thinking about the ways that we can use virtual reality to do that. Often when people think and talk about issues of racism, they tend to focus on a very narrow frame. So um, what's popular in our discourse is unconscious bias, for instance. We have to deal with unconscious bias. And what I would argue is that that's a very narrow way to think about issues of racism. It sort of turns into this thing of, well, everyone has a little bit of bias, or one of the lines, songs from one of my favorite Broadway musicals, everyone's a little bit racist from Avenue Q. Um, and what I would argue is that that kind of washes out, you know, everything, everyone's just a little bit racist and biased against each other. And that's completely ahistorical in thinking about the legacies of racial oppression, the ways in which structures and policies disadvantage particular groups more than others. And so how do we get more people to think about racism in a, as a structural and cultural phenomenon? It also comes up when we think about particular types of imagery. So we might think about someone in a KKK hood, right? And we agree that that is racist. But when we frame racism again so narrowly, it sort of becomes this thing of, well, I would never go to a meeting or put on a hood, so I'm not racist, right? And I would argue that that's not true, right? <laughs> the race, again, the fault of racism is much broader than that. Um, and then this idea of not being racist and your individual designation of being racist or not or biased or not kind of turns into this kind of gold star moment, right? In terms of, do you want an award for not being racist? Are you mostly consumed with your individual designation of whether someone thinks about you as racist or not? I would argue that is narcissistic with the lowercase n. I'm not diagnosing anyone in the room. I'm just saying that <laughs> the focus on the self as opposed to thinking about how racism manifests in society, how racism is a part of our lived, shared experiences, and it's not just about you and whether someone thinks you're a good person or not. So how do we get more people to think about themselves as acting and thinking differently and engaging issues of racism differently? And again, not just being so consumed with their self-designation. So part of what we've done um, is start to think about how to apply our virtual reality work uh, in, in public settings. Um, since June of 2017, 600, 600 or plus CEOs of major global corporations have signed a pact to focus on diversity and inclusion in their organizations. Diversity, equity, inclusion work is a multi-billion dollar industry. And most of what people focus on in that work is unconscious bias. They think about, they think that the solution to their issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion is dealing with unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is an internal belief or attitude. Unconscious bias is problematic, not when it stays in your head. It's problematic when it comes out of your mouth. It's problematic when it shifts into a behavior. It's problematic not just in an individual, it's problematic when most individuals in positions of power who run organizations and make decisions for those organizations are grappling with issues of bias. That's not about an individual problem, that's a structural problem, that's a systemic problem. 
But if we frame it as an individual issue, we'll try to solve individual level problems. We'll try to fix individuals. What do I have to do to overcome my bias? And maybe if I just have an awareness of it, that might just translate into behavior. I would argue that that may not be the case. And if we're dealing with a systemic problem, we need systemic level issue, uh, solutions. So if we frame the problems that we're facing around diversity, equity, and inclusion in our organizations as systems and cultural issues, we need to think about how we redesign systems, how we implement effective structural policies, how we think about cultural transformation. So we want to use virtual reality to help people think about what I argue is an important component of that work, is understanding the problem that we're dealing with. So part of what we're doing in the virtual reality experience is allowing you to walk in the shoes of a black male character named Michael Sterling. The argument here is that being able to walk a mile in these digital shoes might give you an opportunity to experience racism from a visceral, emotional, and deep level. The argument is that the science and the numbers and the statistics aren't quite doing the job. And what will it take to have people engage more deeply? What will it take for the videos of police violence to register as a pattern of racism and not just insubordination on the part of individuals interacting with police? How will our numbers around failure to promote, failure to advance, failure to stay in our organizations register as a structural problem and not a failure of those individuals? If we're engaged in efforts to recruit the best talent from around the country and we bring them, which is a part of diversity equity work, which is quite effective, and we bring them into our organizations and then they don't do well, or we recruit the best talent and they're doing well and then we recruit them to our partner track and then they still don't make it to partner, at some point we have to acknowledge that the problem is the organization and not the talented individuals we've brought into the organization. So in the experience that we've created, we allow you to become a black male as a child, an adolescent, and as an adult who's experiencing racism in different forms across different contexts. Um, if you could forward to the slides that uh, show some of the images. So as a uh, child, you have, uh, not this one. <laughs> I would like to explain that. Well, uh, I will explain. <laughs> I will explain that. That is, a <laughs> that is a white male, an adult male, in blackface, dressed as Trayvon Martin for Halloween. So in response to my TEDx talk that I did about this experience, one of the comments on the video was, kitten memes are greater than thugs. And yeah, it could just be that one comment, but it's also the white guy dressed in blackface as Trayvon. It's also the repre representation of Trayvon in the media as a thug and not a kid who got killed by an adult man and trying to represent him as an angry black man. And what I argue is that those have implications. That is also racism, and it has implications for how we think about issues in our society and how we attempt to solve them. But going to the, the, the virtual reality experience, as a child, we have you, uh, how many in the room, I, I imagine in this room lots of people have done VR, but can I just get a show of hands so I can get a sense of how much detail we're going to? Okay. So in the experience we've created, it's a digital immersive experience where you become an avatar, you can grab and interact with objects, the environment can interact with you, the videos, etc. So as a child, we have you sitting on the floor playing with blocks. Uh, there are kids who are sitting in front of you and they're saying, Michael, Throw the fireball, throw the scary black fireball. Black is always the scariest. When you throw the block, and I'm amazed that we managed to get 98% of people to actually throw the block, and they usually throw the block at the kid who's saying scary black fireball, by the way. So when you throw the block, it triggers a video of a teacher who says, Michael, you're being dangerous, you're gonna hurt someone. In spite of the other kids who are also throwing blocks. I think what's so compelling about this is that we didn't just sort of make that up. We based that on a large empirical body of research that suggests that black children are disciplined more harshly in the classrooms for the same behaviors. And we give you a chance to feel what that feels like. And as this avatar, you have small hands. You're sitting on the floor. We want you to feel like a child. We want you to see what it feels like to have an adult standing over you, berating you for doing something that you just saw your peers do. In the second scene, we have, you can go back one slide. In the second scene, we have you transition to uh, teenage um, years. 
you're in your bedroom, you can play around with the basketball, you can bounce it, you can throw it into a hoop. And being able to use your body in this way is an important component of the experience. So I've developed this work in collaboration with a team at Stanford University, Jeremy Balenson, who's been working in virtual reality for over 20 years, thinking about social and behavioral applications of VR, has found in their work and other people who work in this space have found that being able to use your body makes it feel more like it's happening to you. And being able to see your face in a mirror is an important component of the work. So we incorporate that throughout the piece. So in this piece, you can play around with the basketball. You see an alert that pops up on your computer screen in your room that an unarmed black teen has been shot by a white police officer. We don't say anything else about that. It's just part of what's in your environment. You get a phone call from your white friend who says we're being, you're running late for the basketball game. You then proceed downstairs. Your mother is watching the news, sitting on the couch, and she says, Michael, you need to change. The police are looking for someone who's dressed very similarly to you. Your white friend says, man, don't worry about that. Don't worry. We have to get to the game. And your mama, their mother just then says, don't forget what happened to your brother. So we're trying to capture that it's not just the direct experiences of someone calling you a name. It's also having your mother have to worry about how you're dressed on the street and whether you're going to encounter the police that it's not an uncommon experience in this family. After your mother says this, you grab your hoodie, you put it on, you're on the street. The neighbors on the street are waving to you, uh, wishing you good luck for your game, and all of a sudden a police car pulls up and three officers jump out and tell you to get down on the ground and put your hands up. And we have you, the user, in the headset, get on your knees and put your hands in the air. As the officers curse at you and yell at you and you've done absolutely nothing wrong. That might sound extreme, but again, that's based on stop and frisk data in New York City, where just standing on the street can elicit such an aggressive response from police officers when you look a certain way. In that scene, the lights turn off at one point, and the sound turns off, and then you hear your mother's voice say, just do what you have to do to get home alive. Again, there's a script that many children receive about how to minimize their perception of threat, how to adjust and adapt themselves so that they don't receive the types of uh, negative experiences that they might encounter just from living in a back body. We then have you transition to uh, adulthood where you're applying for a job. You can see that you're putting, as you're putting your resume into a basket that you've attended Yale University. I don't have any affiliation with Yale whatsoever. I just thought that would look nice. And the receptionist <laughs> doesn't take it from you. She just sort of says, well, just put it there, right? She kind of dismisses you. And you walk over and you see the gentleman on the left who at first is the only person there and he sort of blackens up the way he's talking to you. He's trying to be cool as he's talking to you, the black guy. But as soon as the interviewer walks up, he turns back into Chad, more preppy, right? The interviewer completely ignores your presence. He goes right directly to the white candidate and says, you must be our candidate from Yale. We're so excited to meet you. The receptionist corrects the interviewer and says, actually, Michael's our candidate from Yale when they turn and acknowledge you for the first time. He says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. You don't mind if I take him back first, do you? We'll be right with you. You then are in your bathroom, you get a voicemail from the company saying, it was a pleasure to meet you, you're very qualified for the position, you're just not a good cultural fit. I just gave a talk yesterday, I just came back from San Francisco this morning, to a room full of general counsel individuals who said that is not an uncommon thing to hear when you're trying to hire someone in their companies. You're not a good cultural fit. So again, we're trying to give you a sense that this is structural in nature. It's a pattern. It's not just the one time someone calls you a name. It's something that you carry with you from very early in life across the life course. Next slide. Next, next slide, next slide. Thank you. So what we're trying to consider is how do we engage, next slide, how do we engage people, next slide. <laughs> how do we engage private, nonprofit, and university entities around using this work? Since we premiered this work at the Tribeca Film Festival last year, we've received two to three emails a day, I'm not exaggerating, from people saying, can we use this as part of our DEI efforts at our institution? And we're trying to feel this and think about what ways can we add to what's already being done? What can we contribute? Next slide. So what we're doing is critiquing, right, what's already happening in some of these spaces. So from my perspective, we need to move from checked boxes to meaningful change. 
not just sort of illusions of commitment, our annual diversity trainings, your online bias training, and once you've checked that box, you can move on and get whatever merit uh, uh, star that you um, can be awarded for completing those things. Well-placed symbols, so inputting DEI offices that are often under-resourced and don't actually have any power to implement change. Cultural shifts don't equal affinity group happy hours, right? So getting the black people together and the women together to have some wine and cheese doesn't quite do it um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And when you see data indicating a racial pattern, to not imagine that you need to remediate the people who aren't being promoted, but also imagine how the structures and systems and cultures might be disadvantaging them and what might need to be done on that side of the equation. So moving from aesthetic diversity, these symbols and images of diversity, to thinking about deep reimagining, thinking about holistic organizational, organizational reassessment. Next slide. So we're thinking about how can we use this virtual reality tool? So we're collecting empirical data now. Are we really having the impact we hope? Are we shipping, sh shifting empathy? Are we shifting bias? Are we changing the ways people talk and think about these sorts of issues? We think we are. So if that's true, how can we couple that with targeting C-suite strategic senior leadership, thinking about ways that we might uh, support them through executive coaching, as well as thinking about system and curriculum design? How do we add to the VR itself to help people think more deeply about these issues and how they might practically apply that knowledge to their organizations? It's one thing to know your bias. It's quite another thing to know what to do about that. What's the next step? And we're also thinking about ways to apply this in secondary higher ed uh, settings and museums. Next slide. We're also prioritizing organizations that we believe are ready to be bold, to reimagine convention, to move beyond bias and think about structural and cultural change and do what I call the work. Next slide. So we believe that achieving justice, racial justice requires that we understand racism and not an understanding that emerges from intellectual exercise or even in the consumption and production of science, but rather a visceral understanding that connects to spirit and body as much as reason. We believe we're in a moment where people are willing to grapple with the realities of racism in our society, and we believe we're well-positioned to help them do that. Thank you. <laughs>